Okay, in the last video we took a look at uh, polarization and now here we're going to start taking a look at uh, models of light propagation uh, building up the what's called the ray approximation. So we'll start with Huygens principle. You may have already seen this in your mechanics classes but not realized it yet. So let's say you have a wave front here. Let's imagine for a moment that it's a water wave. Um, if it were a water wave, you can think about it as if this is the crest of a water wave, then every point at the top of that crest would be like almost like you had a whole string of pebbles along the top, and you could let them all drop at, at once. And so what Huygens is saying is that every point on a wave front serves as uh, a point for future spherical, what are called wavelets, to propagate out. So here would be a point. Um, this would be, let me draw it a little better. So here's one of the points, there's a wavelet. Um, and we can draw lots and lots of these wavelets all centered around different points. These are all supposed to be bumping out about the same. Now what you can show is that all these in the direction of propagation, so say if we're going forward, all these wavelets will constructively interfere. Oh man. There we go. All, all these wavelets will con constructively interfere to make a new, that's supposed to be a straight line there, wave front, and then the process would repeat again. You would make, propagate more wavelets off of that point there, and then that would make the next wave front, and so forth. And yes, the wave, and these are supposed to be evenly spaced, um, and yes, the uh, the wavelets would propagate backwards as well, but you can show that they will always uh, uh, destructively interfere so you don't uh, propagate anything to the back. All right, now this model was put around by Christian Huygens as a response to a different model of light due to Isaac Newton. Um, in the early days of developing optics, there was debate as to whether light was a particle or a wave. Um, as, as you will see very shortly, if say I shine a, uh, a laser beam or something on a mirror, that light wave, that, that light bounces off just like a billiard ball would bounce off of a wall. Um, looks very, very particle-like and it'd be very hard to imagine that it was otherwise. Um, on the other hand, there were other phenomena, um, such as uh, diffraction and interference, which we'll get into later in this class, um, that looked in awe very, very wave-like. It's sort of like you know, when you looked at uh, water waves coming in on a breakwater or something like that. The light would spread out the same way water waves would uh, spread out at, uh, at a breakwater. So, but the, definitely you could, it, it was hard to argue that uh, in some respects the particle model seemed to work very well. Um, there was also, at the time, one of the big sticking points was if you look at your own shadow, um, you see, it, it, you think you see a sharp demarcation between where the shadow is and where the light is cast. And if light were a wave, you should see a bunch of bright and dark lines right next to this, the demarcation point of the shadow. People weren't seeing that. It's like, well, that seems really compelling to argue for a particle. Eventually, once um, Young and others were able to start measuring the wavelength of light, people realized that the wavelength was so small that those bright and dark shadowy bands right at the demarcation point of your shadow against a wall or whatever 
um, were very, very finely spaced. So finely spaced that the that basically your eye can't pick that out. Um, and so that was the resolution to that. But so Huygens was convinced because the wave model certainly explained interference and diffraction better. He was convinced that the wave waves were the way to go. But he had to come up with some way to show how the particle model worked where the particle model worked well. And what was what was developed is what's called the ray approximation. Basically all you do is you just erect a geometric ray that's perpendicular to the wave front um, and points in the direction of propagation and this geometric ray gets the clever name of just a ray. And it turns out that these rays of light behave very, very particle-like, although proving that they do can be a, a, little, uh, a little tricky, but we'll be uh, getting to that. Okay, and in the modern view, just to round the story out, um, so initially Newton was saying, hey, it looks like a particle. Huygens comes out there and says, hey, it looks like a wave. People debate back and forth about it for about a century or so. They eventually settle in on wave. Then near the end of the 19th century, there was a, uh, in a phenomenon called the photoelectric effect. It's the basis of uh, how solar cells work. Um, the wave model predicted that, yes, if you shine light on a metal or something like that, you should cause electrons to leave it. However, the prediction was that you would have to like shine light on for two weeks before you would get a current, and we knew that you would get a current right away. And there were other issues associated with that, um, where the details were just plain horrendously wrong. At first people thought, well, the math on these things is hard, we use a lot of approximations, Probably we just over approximated, we'll fix it. But as people kept doing more and more and more careful calculations, the nature of the answer didn't change. The resolution to this is again due to Einstein, where he resurrected the particle model of light and said that, basically put out there that the question is a, uh, is light a particle or a wave is a bad question, and the, the answer is yes. Light has both a particle and a wave-like nature. The, the wave nature tends to dominate in long wavelengths, and the particle um, nature tends to dominate at short wavelengths, but the modern interpretation is the wave property tells us the probability that we would detect these photons, these particles of light. Um, and to say, is it a particle or a wave, would be much like if someone held up a coin and you asked, is it a head or a tail? We would say, the, uh, um, the in physics jargon, we would say that the coin exhibits head-tail duality, and we say that light exhibits wave-particle duality. So the answer is it's both the wave property dictates the probability of detecting the particle. But for now, we will stick with the ray model here and stay classical. Okay, so the first thing we can look at is specular reflection. Uh, specular just means you're bouncing off of some smooth surface. So specular reflection. Like let's say a piece of glass or something like that. So here's a, here's a piece of the boundary of a piece of glass. Um, we have a ray of light um, coming in. Um, here we go. Ever. So here is a ray of light coming in. We will say if we call this the. Oh, sorry, that's a bad choice of color. Um, we have a ray of light coming in, much better. We say this is the incident ray. When it hits the surface, um, for pretty much any surface you can imagine, you will get some light bouncing back out, what we call the reflected ray. And some light will 
transmit through, and I'm trying to show it bending at an angle. There we go. Um, and we call that the refracted ray. And we will worry about refraction in a later video series, but for now, we're just going to focus on the reflected ray. Now, as you've probably caught on in physics, whenever a surface is involved, when we measure angles, our preference is always to measure the angle with respect to the normal to the surface. And remember, normal just means the perpendicular, the line that's perpendicular to the surface. So we will say that this that the angle made by the incident ray and the normal, we will call that the angle of incidence, theta sub i. And we'll say that the angle made by the normal and the refracted ray, sorry, reflected ray, is the angle of refraction, theta sub r. And we had known for a very, very long time empirically that the angle, whoa, that the angle of refraction equals the angle of incidence. So it'll always bounce out at the same angle it comes in at. So let's just uh, take a moment here to see how we could possibly get that from uh, Huygens principle. So well, again, let me just draw my surface here. I'm going to apologize in advance. This drawing is going to get very cluttered. Um, I'll try my best though. So this is my surf. This is the interface. This is my surface here. And let's go. Let's get a decent angle of tilt. That always helps a bit. Um, so here is my incident ray. And here, trying to keep the same angle, is my reflected ray. And again, there's my normal. This is theta incident. That's theta reflected. So now the game that we're going to play here is we are going to look at a particular wave front coming that that is associated with this incident ray. So remember the wave front is necessarily going to have to be perpendicular to the ray. So we will say that this is the um, incident wave front. And similarly, we make a slightly different color. We can go ahead and, or actually let me uh, pause for just a moment there. And, and let's go and uh, take a look here. Um, if you play with this for a bit, and it will take a bit, um, well maybe not. Um, if you play with this for a bit, you can convince yourself that this angle right here with respect to the surface is also theta incident. So those two are congruent. Um, similarly, we can do a we can do a similar construction for the uh, uh, or, well actually let's go ahead and look at this wave front as it uh, propagates in. So I'll look at a point right here and say that this is a source of my wavelets. It is going to propagate out and by the time the wavelet makes it to this surface right here, we're going to reflect back and make in that'll be a, the source of a new wave front. So I am going to drop a perpendicular right there and say that this distance is the speed of light times whatever time it takes to get there. Well, by construction, this point was already reflecting 
right off of there and would interfere to make the refract the reflected wavefront. Um, let's try to keep these distances roughly the same. Sorry, I'm trying. So this would be the reflected wavefront. Okay. And similarly here, I can drop, that's supposed to be still a line, I can still drop a perpendicular here. This distance would also be C delta T. You should also be able to convince yourself that this angle right here is also theta reflected. Those are congruent as well. Um, and sorry here, this I really boofed up that line. Let's try that again, making it a little better. Is that line should be going through this point right here. Okay. Doggone it. There. And that's supposed to be perpendicular, and this is just going to make a huge dot there to make that all one point. Um, sorry, I tried. Okay, well, if we look here, there's two triangles I can take a look at here. Let's take a look at this lilac triangle right here. And then let's also go and take a look at, um, I haven't used bright green yet. This bright green triangle right there. I will argue that these two triangles are congruent to each other. First off, these two sides are the same. They're both of length C delta T, therefore they're congruent. They have a hypotenuse in common, so since it's a common hypotenuse, that's automatically congruent. They also have a right angle um, in the same part of the triangle, um, so that's congruent. So these two triangles are congruent um, by side side angle. So that means that this angle here is congruent to that angle there, but this is theta incident and that's theta re reflected. So therefore the angle of reflection equals the angle of incidence and that completes the proof. So feel free to mount back over and uh, run that one by a couple times. Um, <coughs> it's certainly not as clean as Newton's model with the particles. You can just say, hey, particle hits a wall, it bounces. We know that it always bounces out the same angle it came in at. But it turns out that you do get the same result, just more complicated. And since the wave model is more powerful, Classically, people adopted that. Okay, so let's do a quick application of this. Um, let's say you've got yourself some sort of a double mirror uh, configuration, like so. So this is a mirror, that's a mirror. We'll say that the angle between these is 135 degrees. So let's say that you have a ray of light coming in at 70 degrees with respect to the normal. That light will bounce off, hit that surface, then bounce out there. And we would like to know, so if this was 
theta one incident here was equal to 70 degrees, we would like to know what theta two reflected there is. Okay. Well, the trick here is to say, well, if we can figure out what theta two incident is, we know that whatever that is, it's got to be the same thing. Just like we know here that theta one reflected has to be 70 degrees. Okay, but this is a perpendicular that was dropped here. So if that's 70 degrees, that's 20. Okay, so 20 degrees plus 135 degrees, that's 155 degrees. So in order to have 180 degrees in the triangle, that's got to be 25 degrees right there. So, but then this needs to add up to 90, so that means that's 65 degrees. So therefore, by the law of reflection, that is also 65 degrees. Now, I bring this up um, to get to a different application of reflection, what's called diffuse reflection. So diffuse reflection is what happens that if instead of reflecting off of some polished surface, you reflect off of some rough surface. Uh, let me make the, I'm going to zoom way in. So like, let's say you're really zooming in on a piece of paper and you see it isn't as smooth as you thought it was. Um, the light coming in from afar will all be coming in with parallel rays. However, what will happen is they will all obey the law of reflection but they each have their own normal. You have to strike a normal wherever the ray is. So for instance, this ray is gonna bounce over this way and then it's gonna hit that surface and bounce off. On the other hand, um, here, this is almost coming in at the normal. So it's going to bounce out at a very shallow angle. So it's going the other way. This one basically is coming in at the normal, so it's going to more or less bounce straight out. Here, um, this one, it's coming at a fairly steep angle. It's going to bounce away. So this is why if you shine a flashlight on a mirror and you look at the light on the wall, you just see a circle from the flashlight. But if you do it with a piece of paper, you'll see just a more diffuse area that's lit up. Um, sometimes, especially if you happen to be near an area where there are a lot of beach weddings or something like that, um, if you see the uh, photographers taking a, a photo of the uh, couple afterwards, you may see them having somebody holding up basically what looks like a big floppy piece of plastic that has a rough texture but has been spray painted to be kind of shiny. And the whole point of that is to diffusely reflect the uh, light from the sun into the, uh, onto the faces of the subjects. Um, the re usually the reason uh, photographers do that is um, the picture usually looks a little more interesting if the light is to the back but if you do that then you're not really getting a light coming off the front or, or sorry not, not light coming from back usually the light's more interesting if it's coming in off of an angle from the side but that tends to throw shadows across the eyes and then the people look really weird so by bouncing some light diffusely into the faces that uh, fills in the light that uh, was missing to uh, create a weird shadow on the eye and the uh, subject looks more normal. Okay, then finally we're going to go and take a look at what happens if you're just standing in front of a plain mirror. And we're going to use this to start to introduce the idea of ray diagrams, but we'll do more with those later. So 
here we go. We just plain got ourselves a mirror. And let's say you're standing in front of the mirror like so. Um, we call whatever the is standing in front of the optical device, we usually call that the object. And by convention, we usually just draw a big arrow for the object. So we know if things are going to be right side up or upside down. Um, usually you, at the midpoint through, you'll drop what's called the optical axis. like so. Now you know that when you are brushing your teeth in the morning and you're looking in the mirror, you see your evil twin hiding, behind, you know, I'm looking right back at you through the mirror. So let's start to figure out what is happening with that. So to do that, let's track two different rays. One ray will be a ray that goes through, goes along parallel to the optical axis. This gets a special name. It gets called the paraxial ray. Now that light is just going to bounce straight back like so. Um, and then we look at another ray. Um, it often gets called the central ray. And here, this is going to be obeying the law of reflection. So whatever the angle going in is, oops, that would also be the angle going out. Alrighty. So when you're looking through the mirror, you're seeing light coming. So and, and before we go on, there are plenty of other rays coming out. Because keep in mind, the uh, light is being emitted in spherical wave fronts. The rays have to be perpendicular to the wave fronts everywhere. And so there are rays heading off in literally every direction. It's just that these two rays are particularly useful to think about. So when you look through the mirror, these rays are reflected back, look like they're coming from somewhere. So I'm just going to backtrack where these seem to be coming from. And your eye is going to say, hey, there's where my image is located. Okay. So we'll say, whoops, sorry about that. So we'll say that this distance from the object to the mirror is the object distance, and then from here over is the image distance. Um, conventionally, if the image is located behind the mirror, um, we'll say that this is what's called a virtual image. This is an image you can only see by looking through the optical device, in this case, the mirror. Um, if you were to try to stick a screen behind there, you wouldn't be able to form uh, any kind of an image. On the other hand, when you go to the movies, you do have a screen there, so you are seeing a real image being projected onto that screen. But this is what we call a virtual image, and we'll see that by the conventions of things, we will say that this image distance is negative, um, just indicating that the image is where the light is not. Um, on the other hand, we'll say that this object distance is positive. So we get that. So if I go and take a look at this again, the angles are all the same. So we've got right angle, right angle. This angle is that angle by alternate interior angles, which is this also this angle by the law of reflection. So therefore, these two angles are congruent and they share a side in common. So by angle side angle, this triangle here is congruent to that triangle there. So that means if it weren't for the sign convention that we say that the image distance is negative, we'd say these two distances are the same, but here we'll be writing that the image distance is minus 
the object distance. We'll also note the height of the image. So, so this is the height of the object. This is the height of the image. And again, by similar triangles, the image height is equal to the object height. So we can define the lateral magnification of the image. M to be the image height over the object height. Um, this is equal to one here. I'll also just cryptically observe that's equal to minus uh, di over do because that'll turn out that for optical devices that aren't flat mirrors that that also works out. So since it's upright the magnification is positive. Okay, so here's a question for you to think about. So when you stand in the mirror and you're brushing your teeth, um, and you look at your evil twin there, you swear that your evil twin is brushing with the other hand. And so you might think that the image is flipped right to left, but it's not. What direction is flipped? Think about that for a moment, and I'll get back with you. Okay, so it turns out that what gets flipped is not um, right and left, it's front and back. Um, if something is closer to the mirror, its image will also be closer to the mirror. So it's front and back that get flipped. Now a clue as to why we think when you're looking at a person in the mirror that you think it's right and left that get flipped. A good clue would be if you happen to have available a latex or a nitrile glove, go put it on your right hand and then just peel it straight back. If you do that, you'll now find that you made yourself a glove that can fit on your left hand. So what's happening is when you're standing on one side of the mirror and you're seeing the person, quote unquote, on the other side, your brain doesn't understand that it's seeing the reflection of a person that's been reflected front to back. Um, what your brain does as part of its whole threat assessment thing is whenever it looks at anything living, it actually moves your where it perceives yourself to be over to where that living creature is. Um, so you do quite literally put yourself, mentally put yourself into other people's shoes all the time. Um, but in order for you to do that mentally, what you do is you wind up walking mentally around the mirror and flip yourself around. So then you would realize, oh, if, for example, you were brushing your teeth with your right hand, um, and you see the image of the person in your left hand, once you've walked around the mirror and you put yourself in that mental space, you map that to your left hand. But it is actually still your right hand, it's just been flipped front to back. So just like when you pull the glove off front to back, it became a left-handed glove, it's the same deal. Your right hand flipped front to back looks like a left hand, so your brain says, oh, it must be flipped side to side rather than front to back, which is what is actually happening. Alrighty, and with that, I will catch you in the next one.